very warm welcome to all of you joining. We've had a terrific sign up for this roundtable, and um, we have participants um, across many time zones from about 30 different countries. So I'm very grateful to all of you for, for your interest and for, for your time in joining us. Um, the, the roundtable is part of a series run by the British Council globally called The Climate Connection. It's part of the British Council's engagement with COP26. And tonight um, in Japan time, we'll be, we'll be hearing about four um, very different projects that um, are each advancing research to support clean growth across the ASEAN region. The roundtable is, is really in two parts. Um, to begin with, we're going to hand over to the lead researchers and their teams to introduce the projects. And then with the help of Associate Professor Aishari as our, um, as, as our facilitator, we'll move into more of an open panel discussion and think about the, the learning and discoveries from these research projects um, their sustainability and, and the value that they're delivering. If you have any questions, um, you, you can post them into the chat and either the speakers or the panelists will do their best to pick them up. If you're having any technical problems, um, we will share Tomoko's email address and you can, you can write to her and we'll do our very best to resolve them. But let me now hand over to the British ambassadors to Japan Julia Longbottom, who is going to give us some opening remarks. Thank you very much. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's roundtable, which will explore innovative approaches to collaborative research into climate change. On Sunday, the 26th UN Climate Change Conference of the Parties, COP26, opens in Glasgow, Scotland. The summit will bring together policymakers and climate experts from around the world with the objective of accelerating action to achieve the goals laid out in the Paris Agreement and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. The British government's objective is to hold a whole of society COP which engages not only policymakers and climate experts, but everyone, and especially young people, whose futures will be shaped by the decisions and actions that arise from COP26. As part of the lead up to COP26, and in line with the UK government's ambitions, the British Council has been leading a global cultural relations programme called the Climate Connection, which provides a platform for dialogue cooperation and action against climate change, and which puts young people at its heart, enabling them to gain the skills and networks to participate in meaningful dialogue about the climate crisis. Today's event is part of the Climate Connection Programme, and it's the final discussion in a series of roundtables which have examined the role and response of the higher education sector to the climate crisis. The roundtable will explore the challenges and successes of a Climate Connection Trilateral Research Grant Programme. The programme funded four projects which brought together researchers from universities from the UK and the countries of ASEAN, bring research topics as diverse as innovative soldering materials for power electronics, developing a software framework for decarbonisation, and bioenergy and water management risks. The research teams will present their projects followed by a discussion about what researchers can learn from multilateral collaboration models, how these can be improved, and what incentives should be put in place to bring together international research expertise to achieve maximum impact. We hope this event will demonstrate the power and value of a multilateral approach to research which brings together expertise from across the planet to focus on the shared global challenge of climate change. I sincerely hope you enjoy the event and that it provides you with some valuable insights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia, for getting us off to a great start. 
Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce the first of our lead researchers, and that is Dr. Guangming Zhang from Liverpool John Moores University, who will be introducing that project that Julia just mentioned around next generation solder materials. So, Dr. Zhang, over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So, my name is Guangming Zhang. I'm at the moment, I'm leading a COP26 Trinitary Research Initiative project, Go Green, Next Generation Solder Materials for Power Electronics and Green Electric Transport. Uh, in partnership with uh, uh, Professor Eiko Chuhoji from Gamma University, Japan, and Dr. Arif from Unimap, University of Malaysia. So we have pre-recorded our presentation. It will be 14 minutes, one four, 14 minutes long. So after presentation, we'll have six minutes for commentary. So um, just please, uh, please a video record for us, please. Thank you. Hello all. We are delighted to present our work, Go Green, as part of COP26, and as one of the recipients of funding from the British Council of Japan Climate Connection Trilateral Research Initiative. I am Professor David Harvey, a Professor of Electronic Engineering from Liverpool, John Moores University, UK, and along with my colleagues from Japan, Malaysia, and the UK, we will present a snapshot of the work we are doing. Our project Go Green is designing new green solders to better connect electronic chip and components that in turn will make up electric vehicles, smartphones and many, many modern devices. Any small environmental gain we can make at the circuit level will have an exponential gain if the methods are adopted globally. To do this, we have a team of experts in materials and electronic engineering to advance and test the premise of how new types of solder can save energy whilst improving product reliability. If the lifetime of a product can be doubled, then manufacturing, materials and recycling costs will be approximately halved, saving energy. The objectives and key deliverables of the work aim to have significant impact on the efficient engineering of manufactured electronics for use in very harsh environments such as electric vehicles, solar energy and wind farms. As you read the technical deliverables on the slide, I want to highlight a major aspect of Go Green, which is to promote the work, particularly in Malaysia, to better engage industry and the general public in the challenges the Earth faces. Details now will be given in turn by each of the partners, followed by short conclusions from this problem program and anticipated outcomes from the work in the longer term with support from Malaysian academia and from industry. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Arif from University Malaysia Police. So for the progress of our COP26 Trilateral Research Initiative, uh, we have successfully organized a webinar, uh, which is a webinar on green electronics for electric vehicle manufacturing. Uh, this webinar has have attracted uh, around 190 participants from Malaysia, Australia, UK and Japan, where may, mainly the participants are majorly from Malaysia, uh, including from the academ academics, students, and also from industries in the automotive area and also solder manufacturing uh, industries, majorly in Malaysia. So during this session, is um, we have uh, three sessions. First of all is on the e-mobility development in Malaysia uh, by Dr. Rita Mohamed Said. And also the second session is uh, on the evaluation of mechanical properties of lead-free solder and reliability of uh, solder ball joints by Prof. Professor Iko Shoji from Gunma University, Japan. 
And also the third session is on the NDE and big data based prognostic and health monitoring of extreme environment uh, electronics by Dr. Guang Ming Zhang from Liverpool John Moores University, UK. Our group uh, basically is um, uh, the Electronic Packaging Materials Research Group under the Center of Excellence, Geopolymer and Green Technology, University of Malaysia Perlis. Mm -hmm. So we are focusing more on the fabrication of the solar alloy using the casting method. Uh, and also we do manufacture the solar balls for ball grid array interconnects, where majorly we do uh, microstructure and also thermal property studies. So here are the images of some of the uh, uh, samples of uh, solder joints microstructure uh, that we did in our lab. Besides using conventional characterization techniques, we also use the advanced characterization techniques such as using the synchrotron experiments so we have done uh, several uh, synchrotron experiments, mainly in uh, synchrotron Thailand and also synchrotron Japan. This is to uh, normally is to understand and also to look into the microstructure and also phases that forms inside our solder materials that we have developed. Okay, from Guma University, Japan. Our major is electric packaging materials, soldering and brazing, and dissimilar bonding and plating. This figure shows CO2 emission in Japan. The field with many discharges are industry and the traffic field. In Japan, our target is goal 2050 carbon neutral. To go carbon neutral, in the industry field, Low power consumption inverter is required. Also, in the automobile field, low power consumption inverter converter are required. Then, new power semiconductor devices are expected and high reliable joining materials are required for such next generation packages. In this Go Green project, we conducted three experiments. We will receive solder ball joint from Unimap. We conduct ball impact test and investigate ball shear force and energy. Also, we conduct microstructure observation to investigate intermetallic compound growth in the joint interface. Moreover, we conduct a tensile test using miniature sized specimens. The result shows the effect of addition of antimony into tin silver copper lightweight solder. The obtained data are shared with Unimap and Liverpool JMU to develop a highly reliable lightweight solder. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Kwon Min Zhang from Liverpool Chalmers University, United Kingdom. In this project, the Liverpool team's main research tasks focus on non-destructive reliability testing of solar joints and power electronics, subject to accelerate the environmental testing for the new developed net-free solar materials and the electric interconnects at the package level and the board level. We have developed unique expertise in three-dimensional acoustic microimaging, which can see through the microelectronic packages to detect buried micro defects inside the packaging and the hidden sort of joints. We can not only detect the defects, but also locate the defects in which in the face for the martinet structure due to the super resolution of our 3D acoustic microimaging techniques. The Liverpool team also have developed unique expertise in through-life monitoring of 
micro electronic packages on the basis of ultrasonic inspection. We can diagnose and track through knife quantity of individual salt joint from crack initiation, propagation to failure. For example, this figure shows the real knife of individual salt joints in a flip chip package when subject to thermal cycling test. The real knife was obtained through our ultrasonic non destructive monitoring, also high frequency acoustic modeling and simulation is conducted in the Liverpool team to help improve the accuracy of our ultrasonic monitoring technique. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Flora Samidin from the University of Malaysia Police in IMEP. Summing up, we are very grateful to COP26 Telateral Research Initiative, a collaboration in the field of green electronics and green vehicles between three countries, Malaysia, UK, and Japan has been established. Subsequently, we hope that we can raise awareness of climate and environmental challenges in Malaysia and also in other regions. At the end of these projects, next generation solder materials and high available electric interconnects for power, electronics and electric vehicles will be developed. Finally, this is our anticipated outcomes. Actually, one of the key sectors to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Malaysia is transportation. This project accelerates the electrification of vehicles aligned to the Green Technology Master Plan Malaysia 2017-2030. Also, through this project, we hope to gain public awareness that using green soldier can actually reduce environmental and health hazards with the use and recycle of electronic products. Thank you. Good day, everyone. I'm Professor Dr. Zaliman Sauli, the Vice Chancellor of University Malaysia Police. Would like to extend my appreciation and full support to the COP26 Trilateral Research Initiative 2021-2022 on the project Go Green: Next Generation Solder Materials for Power Electronics and Green Electric Transport by University of Malaysia Police, Malaysia and Liverpool John Malls University, United Kingdom and Ganma University, Japan. I have seen that the progress of the project is tremendously giving huge social and technology impact, particularly to Malaysia and Southeast Asia regions in the area of green solder manufacturing and green vehicles. So this project has also promoted an awareness of climate and environmental challenge in Malaysia and this, the South East Asia region through series of seminars and workshops that have benefited to the industry and academia. So I hope that the research network and sustainable collaboration in the field by this trilateral academic collaboration could be continued and further strengthened across the three partners countries. Thank you. Hello, good day to all. Uh, and I'm Balin, uh, Balin like you said, Muganathan. Okay, uh, I'm managing director of Qualitech uh, Solution. Uh, we are a solar supplier and manufacturer in Malaysia and uh, for the region of Southeast Asia. Uh, I would like to extend my uh, support uh, to COP26 uh, Trilateral Research Initiative 2021-2022 to on the project of uh, Go Green, uh, next generation uh, of solar materials for power electronics and green vehicle. <coughs> Uh, uh, green Electric uh, Transport by University Malaysia Police from Malaysia uh, and Liverpool uh, John Morris uh, University from UK 
in Ganma University, uh, Japan. I've seen the project uh, give a huge uh, impact um, to the industry in the green solder material uh, and green vehicle. Uh, I hope that this research uh, could be uh, continued uh, to strengthen the research network between the industry and also the academia. So thank you to all. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Yeah, so we have five, six minutes now for comments. The comments will come from the commentary panel. Any comments? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Dave. Any comments? Is that working or? Hello. Hello, Dave, any comments? Yes, I just want to reiterate the uh, gratitude the three partners have got from being able to conduct this research. Uh, just to preempt the panel in the afternoon, uh, these partnerships take time to develop. And this partnership only developed because Liverpool John Moores University and Unimap have gone out of their way over the past uh, five years to build up some relationships. So a team came over from Unimap, quite a high level team, and we were able in the meeting to link together certain researchers. So it's when the team from John Moores University in, uh, I'd say, electronic engineering met the team in Malaysia, including Arif as the leader in material science, we could see were complementary. So this type of project allowed different ideas across the field. And from that relationship, we got uh, some Newton funding. So we did a uh, Newton project. And sitting next to me is a postdoctor, a young researcher, she can wave uh, Teresa, who yeah. was employed on that project. So she's Spanish. So it's through multinational projects and that's had some good results and we're fortunate enough as that project finished with a short gap we're able to link in with Japan through contacts again and a new contact but through through our network we're able to find uh, Gunma University and put the project together and we're delighted to have been successful to get further funding but as all engineering the projects never finished uh, we're developing new types of solders with uh, nanotechnology, new nanostructures in the Asian partners. And the UK partners are doing a bit more on the engineering and testing of the solders for real products. So it's a true relationship. Uh, sorry, there's no voice translation in, in my Spanish or uh, Japanese aren't very good or Chinese. So. So we're delighted to have a project, but we haven't finished yet. Um, we're planning to have another fairly major seminar towards the end in Malaysia, when people can travel, and possibly in Japan. But of course, with the present uh, situation on travel, it may go online. But yeah, we still managed to achieve something in the project. Uh, we're building new solders, and we've done some dissemination. So I don't know, maybe if Iris wants to say something from Malaysian side. And Arif, any comments? Hello. Hello, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Arif from University of Malaysia Police. Uh, so just a short comment uh, on this project. Uh, I think it, 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 it gives a huge impact, uh, especially for these uh, three, uh, from these three partners where each of us have our own expertise, uh, especially uh, for us, for example, in Unimap, in Malaysia, we, um, we majorly develop the solder materials, whereby the expertise from Japan is majorly um, focusing more on the reliability 
performance of the shoulder joint. Uh, and also from uh, Liverpool, John Moore is more on the uh, on the non-destructive monitoring. So this fulfills the uh, development of our uh, lead-free solder manufacturing, especially on uh, the application for harsh environment and also for electric vehicle applications. Uh, yeah, as mentioned by Prof. David Harvey just now. Um, that we are targeting to, we have actually organized a big seminar, which have attracted almost 190 participants, which also consists of uh, people or participants from the government agencies in Malaysia, uh, the industries, especially uh, in the area of automotive uh, manufacturing, and also the industries of the solder manufacturer itself. So we hope that towards the end of this project, we will, we will plan to have another a seminar to uh, wrap up this uh, project and also to share on our 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 outcomes of the project uh, very soon. That's all from me, Ming. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Aru. Uh, any comments, uh, Professor Suhoji? A short one or short a quick one? Hello, Ming. <laughs> thank you. Hello, Hello everyone uh, from Gumei University, Japan. Uh, my back is uh, Cambridge. But now in, I'm in Japan. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my name is Ika Shoji. Uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to take part in this Go Green project. Uh, we conduct to investigate the mechanical properties of light hood solder joint. So uh, the result uh, will be interesting and valuable for us. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, our lady, Teresa, will have a quick Hello. comment. My name is Teresa and I just started working in this project last week, but I work in the previous collaboration with Malaysia, where we did very interesting work. And I have a background in material science and engineering, and here we focus on the reliability testing side. So yeah, it's a good mix of backgrounds and expertise. And I'm looking forward to this collaboration and to do work now with Japan and Malaysia. Thank you, Theresa. I think we have uh, overrun a little bit the time. Thanks. That uh, I think that's all the presentation and the commentary from our site, New Pujuan Morris University. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Guangming, to you and thanks, your team for introducing you, that project and we look forward to, to hearing more as you progress. Thanks. So we move on to the second multilateral collaboration. And um, the second project is looking at decarbonization planning across ASEAN. And it involves the University of Nottingham's Malaysia campus. Um, on screen, we have Dr. Michael Short from Surrey and um, I expect at some point in the next 20 minutes, we will also meet um, one of your colleagues from the University of Tokyo. So Dr. Michael, let me hand over to you. You're muted. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, thanks very much for the, for the invitation. And um, it's a pleasure to be here to present some of our initial work on um, a software framework for optimal decarbonization planning for ASEAN countries. Um, this, is a, this has been a, a, a team project from, from all over the place, as you can see, and we've had many Zoom meetings over many time zones um, with uh, the University of Nottingham, Malaysia, the University of Tokyo, and the University of Surrey as the, the main um, drivers of the partnership with Monash University, De La Salle University in the Philippines, and MGTC, which is a government agency within uh, Malaysia as the um, associated partners. Um, so, and I'm, we're very grateful for the British Council for, the, for funding this project. Let me just kind of hop in. This is all preliminary work, but obviously you're all aware of the graveness of the situation facing us in the, in the build-up to COP26, and we're hoping for um, some drastic action to be to be seen. Um, just this is just kind of a reminder to everybody as, as to how serious the situation is with regards to decarbonization. The reason for the focus on ASEAN nations is because as developing nations, as you can see in the bottom left-hand image, um, CO2 emissions are rising rapidly in the region. 
and um, they're also investing quite heavily in in new in new power generation. And so it's important that they that uh, these countries have the policy the decision making tools to make good de decisions with regards to where they're investing their funding. Um, we focused on Malaysia uh, as our case study for the ASEAN region. So at COP21, Malaysia pledged to reduce its carbon emission intensity per GDP by 35% in 2030 relative to the 2005 levels, or 45% with support from developed countries. The region, the Malaysian government is against nuclear energy due to concerns about um, the waste, and they also have a low wind energy potential. And so mostly their potential is in, bio, is in utilizing biomass resources as across most of the ASEAN region, as well as um, solar. Um, these two images just show the, the firstly on the left, the, uh, the rise in population, as well as the rise in, in wealth, which generally means a higher electricity demand per capita. And you can also see on the right hand side, the current fuel mix inside of their, in their electricity production up to 2017. Coal still makes a massive proportion of the generation and, is, and it has in fact expanded over the last 10 years. Um, and natural gas also forms a large amount with hydro being the only real penetration of renewables in, in the grid. And so you can see that we might have a place for carbon dioxide removal here because of the investment in coal that's already taken place over the last 10 years. So CO2 removal, um, according to the IPCC, has, is going to be required to limit, limit global warming to well below two degrees Celsius. Negative emissions technologies can compensate for emissions of greenhouse gases from sectors that are impossible to decarbonize, for example, transportation. Um, these are just some examples that we've, we've looked at and, and modeled. So carbon capture and storage, as I'm sure you, you're aware of, is a new technology that, is, that a number of prototypes have, have um, gone, into, um, gone into production. And basically, you're capturing CO2 from a point source, so from, directly from a flue gas, from a carb, uh, from a carbon intensive um, uh, energy producer, for example, a coal power plant, and depositing that in um, gas reservoirs, depleted oil gas reservoirs. Um, direct air capture is also a new technology that um, uses energy. So it's, it's, a, it's an energy user in order to capture, capture carbon dioxide directly from the air. Um, we also have bioenergy with CCS, which is a carbon negative energy producing negative emission technology and also biochar as a, as a negative emission technology. And so our goal was to develop an open source software package, which we call DECO2, uh, which is a deep, stands for decarbonization options optimization. It's an open source software framework that's available freely on GitHub at that um, link over there. It's based on mixed integer linear programming formulations, which allow for um, long-term long, long, uh, long energy planning. And users interact with this through, um, through Excel spreadsheets. So a user will input their energy forecasts for their specific region, the technologies that they're interested in, the pricing. We can have price forecasts for our different um, feedstocks and we can also replace feedstocks in existing plants. So for example, um, swapping out natural gas for biogas as, as an example. The, um, the way that we deal with this is kind of inspired by a technique called SEPA, which um, itself is inspired by pinch technology, so this stands for carbon emissions pinch analysis, pinch, pinch analysis, which is related to pinch technology, which was used in the chemical industry as a way to match hot and cold streams in very large, um, in very large chemical plants to save um, to save on energy costs. And we have a growing library of processes, feedstock data, um, and so forth. And in only six months, we've already got a prototype working, and I'll show you some of our initial results and what the output looks like. Um, the, we, we develop a user manual to help with, uh, users with installation, and we're planning to make this, make this an easier process as we engage more with our stakeholders in the uh, next six months of the project. Um, I'd like to thank Octorac for all of the support that they've given us. They're a local um, optimization solver company here in London. And um, they've got a free, free solver that we've, um, we've been using in, in the back end. And also to the Foundation for Public Code for helping us with the, um, with the open source formulation to ensure that other, gov that other government agencies will be able to access and use this software once we're, once we're done. Um, our preliminary case study was to look at power plants in Peninsula, Malaysia. Um, so that's a collection of 38 power plants, and we model how we should invest our funds from 2020 to 2050 based on forecasts and discussions with MGTC. Um, so we allow for different plants. So this is individual plants to switch feedstocks or to even mix feedstocks um, and be retrofitted with CCS or decommissioned for replacement with renewable energy. 
and we can consider investments in different types of negative emissions technologies. So an example of, how, of why we've taken this approach and, and how it kind of simplifies the process of energy planning is this pinch composite curve, which is kind of that, that thing that it was inspired by heat integration. On this curve, uh, the blue line represents our demand composite curve. So that shows our demand and our target for CO2 load. So if we set a limit within the optimization software to limit emissions to below 60 megatons per year of CO2, then we can see how we can, um, and a demand of 120 terawatt hours at the, on the bottom axis, then we can see how we can meet that using um, different sources of, it, of, of power. And so coal with a high slope, with a, with a steep slope, has a high carbon intensity. So the amount of energy produced um, is low relative to its CO2 load, so its CO2 emission. So this is the sum of all the coal plants that we showed you on that previous slide. And um, in the first period from 2020 to 2025, the model here, when we minimize the budget subject to emission constraints, decides to, um, as the first investment decision, to, to decommission some of the coal plants, which is actually already planned. And so we actually kind of um, predicted that the government should make certain decisions and they, that they've already made, which is a good sign for our model. And, um, they, and the model decides to switch to one of the biomass types as a replacement for coal in, in some of the other coal plants. Um, over time, we can see that the model makes more and more uh, decisions as our demand increases and our CO2 emission limits decrease. And we can see that we have to supplement with some renewable energy. And we also replace some of our natural gas with biogas and coal is completely decommissioned by 2030 or not decommissioned, replaced with, with one of the biomass types. And just to kind of show you how this works, um, over time, you can see the, the model making different predictions um, in relation to how, it, how we should invest our funds. To reach this very low CO2 load limit, load, we are actually going to need energy producing and energy consuming negative emissions technologies as, um, as ways to meet this ex quite, quite, extremely, quite extreme CO2 emission limit uh, for the energy planning period. Um, and uh, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage is our preferred option due to its energy generation capacity, as opposed to just an energy consuming negative emission technology. Um, when we implement some other types of constraints in the model, so in this case, we don't, we, we try to minimize emissions with a set um, amount of a budget per, per period. So these are five year periods and our budget allocations um, were given as um, we're, we're increasing every five year period to somewhere between 2.4 billion US dollars per year, um, which is a lot. And, and as you can see with this budget, we cannot actually meet our um, carbon emission targets. So our targets are here, but we, with, with this limited, more limited budget, we're unable to actually um, meet our, our um, targets. And with, so this shows that you need to incorporate um, budgeting and um, budgeting within, within the, these models as we can see that our targets can be quite unrealistic unless we, we include all of this. And interestingly enough, um, no renewable generation was predicted by this model uh, from 2020 to 2030. And this is because they've already got quite a large, Malaysia already has quite a large investment in, um, in uh, fossil fuels. And so it's very difficult for the model to make a good decision to make um, to, to incorporate renewables into a system that already is producing enough for those demands in those earlier periods. The model also shows that it's clear that we need feed in tariffs in order to um, encourage um, in order to encourage renewable en energy generation within the Malaysian grid. And we also validated certain decisions that were already made by the Malaysian government in terms of decommissioning certain plants. Um, and I know that I'm probably running a little bit over time, so I just like to say that we've so we've developed this mathematical optimization based model for planning future decisions within the energy sector that can be easily scaled. Um, we've engaged with our project partners to identify data and areas of concern. This is all obviously preliminary results and I wouldn't make any decisions on this yet. It's only six months into the project. Um, and the initial modeling is quite promising with our suggestions for decommissioning and retrofitting. And we've received very good feedback on how to visualize these decisions and um, within, within these quite large scale systems. And obviously, even though we're showing our data in this form, we, we, we also have information as to exactly which plants should be retrofitted with what technologies when. Um, the future work is to um, have the workshops that were actually planned for October, but because of COVID, we've decided to move it along. So we're going to have workshops and more partner engagement early in the next year. 
um, and we're going to increase our data collection. We've, we're also looking at doing optimization under uncertainty, as many of our parameters are uncertain. And um, we're also hoping to increase our forecasting capabilities over the next while. Um, I just want to show a picture of the team at one of our team meetings. Um, this obviously wouldn't be wouldn't be possible without all of these great people. And um, the bouncing of ideas between these international teams has really been great for me. Um, special shout out to Puru, who's been the main developer of all the software. He'll be making a making a comment for, for you um, soon, and he's based in Malaysia. It's been a pleasure working with him. Um, it's really great work that he's done in, in only six months. Um, and finally, I'd like to acknowledge all of the people that have made this possible and all of the funding sources. And um, and thank you very much for taking the time to, to listen to this. And I'm sorry if I ran over time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are you going to invite a couple of your colleagues to, to chip in now? Yeah, absolutely. So who is here? I know Puru is here. So um, Puru, do you want to do you want to get us going? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so yeah, we have some coronary picture right behind me regarding what's happening before and after climate change. Anyway, um, I started with a project with uh, Dr. Michael Short and the rest of the team back in April, if I'm not mistaken. I started with actually zero Python knowledge. So uh, working was working very closely with um, Dr. Michael to actually learn the background of Python in the first place and then develop the model slow and easy, week, week in, week out, meetings with Zoom. It's not exactly been the easiest thing to learn entirely brand new on basically on my own, just having these weekly meetings, but with a lot of support through emails and also Zoom, we have actually managed to build a model. And uh, I think there's a lot more potential that we could actually do with the model in terms of predicting at what Dr. Michael said, which plans to be decommissioned and everything. Excited because uh, I will be traveling to the UK in January, uh, given that there has been some sort of loosening of the travel restriction. So I'll be excited to meet Dr. Michael's team there, which uh, I could further uh, increase my depth of my Python knowledge and do a lot more things with the model, uh, a lot more predictions and hopefully uh, more concrete results in the next six months of our project. So it's been a pleasure. It's been, I think, especially working with the Japan team as well as uh, Dominic, who happens to be my PhD supervisor as well. So yeah, it's been really great. It's been a great knowledge transfer and looking forward to a lot more to come. Thanks, Peru. Um, Julie, would you like to have a, have a word? Um, Dr. Dr. Julie Tan? Would you like to uh, have a have a comment for us? Are you available? The other thing, Michael, just to flag is that there's a good question in the in the chat. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a. I, a I can't from, actually. From, I, from, I see. It's a question from Helen. Um, do you want me to read it out or can you see it? Um, I can see it. Is there any special merit to engage with the UK plan or EU in executing this carbon neutral system? Um, with, is there any merit with UK in particular over EU in executing the carbon neutral system? Um, well, I, I think that the, the, main, the main benefit of, of bringing together the, the UK partners and the Japanese partners and the Malaysian partners is actually there's an interesting relationship between Malaysia and Japan in terms of how energy is, um, well, firstly, to, to, to bring the, the Japanese partners and the, the reason for them is because there's a, there's a lot of um, exchange of biomass between Malaysia and Japan. And um, so in order for, for Japan to meet some of its um, carbon neutral, to meet its carbon neutral agenda, it is actually um, importing a lot of, of biomass from um, the Sarawak region um, of Malaysia, which is, which is interesting. I think from, from my perspective, obviously the UK has made very, very strong um, legal commitments to decarbonization. Um, and I would say that we are kind of the world leaders in, um, in, in, decarbonizing quickly. Um, and I would also say that maybe the, the background that we bring from our side has mostly been on the modeling side and the optimization side, as I, I am actually not so much an energy planning expert. And actually, the Malaysian side is definitely the energy planning expertise here. And I am more of a supporting role in terms of the optimization modeling, which is my background. Um, more of a, I'm more of an applied mathematician than I am an energy planning expert. Um, so uh, maybe maybe we can bring in another commenter from from the group. Um, I think we've got Dominic. Would would you like to say a couple of words? 
Hello. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, yes, thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really a fantastic experience to work with people from different culture. I have long experience working with uh, European, but it's the first time working with uh, Japanese. So thank the team from University of Tokyo uh, for supporting us in this project. And uh, thanks to British Council to support us uh, through the uh, Japan British Council Fund um, in order for us to do something important uh, for Malaysia as well as for the global community. Uh, another team member of us, uh, Raymond Tan, mentioned that uh, if we can reduce CO2 in, in Malaysia, it also benefits the whole world because uh, emissions have no boundary. It goes everywhere. So I think uh, it, it's a really uh, nice experience working with all these people. We are supposed to meet each other face-to-face -face, uh, last is that August that we were supposed to meet yeah. each other, but uh, because of pandemic, uh, we, we didn't get to we'll see each other face to face. But luckily, we have the I, uh, information technology that bring us uh, at least seeing each other on the screen and we work together. Uh, yeah. So thanks to the thanks to Mike and the team from Sare that helped uh, Puru a lot in, in coding the optimization framework and uh, the the I think the nice now. Uh, we just need to. Uh, provide some uh, analysis to see how can we benefit the rest of the well, potential user uh, who will come and join us in the, in the workshop in, in February next year and uh, hoping that they will be able to do something to decarbonize their companies, the uh, uh, sectors or even the government sectors or, or the, the um, uh, whatever application they were intended to do. Yeah, let's look forward for that. Great. Thanks, Dominic. Um, Thanks. I don't see any of the uh, commenters that we put down from the University of Tokyo side, but uh, Disney, would you like to um, say a couple Disney words? Yeah, yeah, Disney, Disney is, uh, has, um, is around. I'm sorry to put you on the spot if you haven't prepared anything, but it would be great to get some, um, some comments from the University of Tokyo side. Disney, if you don't mind. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Mike. And uh, it, it has been a great opportunity, especially uh, if I talk about myself as an early career scientist uh, to work with, um, I have uh, done uh, projects only with um, Japanese people in Japan, here in Japan. So it is a great opportunity to work with uh, Malaysian team and the European team, uh, British team especially, and um, sharing the knowledge and experience and meeting the uh, people from the different backgrounds and the cultures and how they manage the project, balancing all the schedules and uh, sharing the workload, it's, it's really beautiful. So it, it is a great opportunity for me. If I talk about the Tokyo uh, group, I think we have made a good uh, network with the UK and Malaysia. So it, it is a great opportunity for everybody. Thanks, Disney. Thank um, you. I think we're, we're running a little bit low on time. Just one last comment is that global problems need global teams to solve them and i think that this uh, this project uh, that the british council has put to, put together with these trilateral partnerships really really um do help and uh, we've gotten plenty of ideas for to solve british problems from our partners um, overseas um great so thank, thank you. you very much thank you all and disney and dominic some of the some of the the issues that you are getting us into there will will absolutely come up in the in the in the panel discussion Julie, I can see you're you're online um, at Monash. Yeah, yeah, Mike. Sorry, Monash, sorry. Hi, hi. In? Yeah, yeah. Hi, everyone. Okay, sorry. Just now, I was I was on an urgent call. My apologies. Yeah, I, I'm glad that uh, to be part of the team. Okay, to studies on these global issues of uh, CPO. So yeah, uh, it really a great experience. So we hope that you know through the work done, okay, we can contribute a little bit, you know, or more. Okay, to, to improve um, uh, and to, to come up with more uh, outcomes, uh, valuable inputs that contribute to the um, academics as well as uh, the improvements of the carbon footprint in overall. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. That's great. Uh, it's a fascinating and inspiring project. Uh, thanks yeah. for telling us about it. Yeah. Um, we move on now to Tafik. Associate Professor Aishari at Birmingham City. And we move into, uh, again, a very different project 
this time focusing on bioenergy in Indonesia. So Tofik, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thank you, Matt. I hope my voice is audible and my screen is visible to all. Um, right, yeah. thank you very much for the uh, opportunity. You can see that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'm representing uh, our consortium. So we, we, we are a Brigham City University, uh, University of Tokyo and Gorontalo State University uh, in Indonesia. Uh, we are working on a project on uh, scaling up uh, Indonesian's bioenergy potential through assessment of Wallacea's plant species. Uh, actually, we are focusing on two things in our project. So the first thing is on the data, data-driven energy harvesting. And the second point is on the community-centered approach. I think in terms of the importance of uh, uh, decarbonization decarbon carbon carbon does not need uh, further uh, emphasize. Uh, I think in uh, the previous two projects, they have elaborated quite well on the needs of decarbonization, on the uh, importance of mitigating the impact of the uh, greenhouse effect, uh, etc. So we see a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, initiative strategies across uh, countries. We see um, uh, a, a number of countries looking at the uh, bioenergy as a potential alter energy alternative uh, to achieve these uh, decarbonizations. Uh, we look at Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia has uh, mandated a bioenergy target of up to 40%, hopefully by 2030. And at the moment, uh, the country has a high reliance on the oil palm as the bioenergy source. Uh, the problem with oil palm is um, is there, but at the same time, uh, in the country itself, in the introduced uh, deforestation, as we can see from the image here. Uh, so that actually, uh, it could be a solutions to let's say alternative uh, bioenergy source, but at the same time, it create another issue that needs to be uh, addressed. Uh, on the other hand, we also have this uh, issue on the uh, limited alternative for uh, bioenergy supply. Um, and in order to understand more about this uh, alternative, then we need to understand uh, what kind of data we are able to gather, uh, what, what actually currently the issue is, and to what extent we can gather some of this alternative from the uh, uh, natural resources within the country itself. So we, we, we consist of the uh, three uh, uh, primary universities as, as the consortium partners. We are working across uh, different disciplines. I myself, I am not claiming I'm an energy expert. I actually, I came from the uh, computing background. My, my team has been working on the uh, information technology and uh, data science and artificial intelligence. Uh, we are working closely with the um, University, Universitas Negeri Gorontalo or Gorontalo State University, uh, which has expertise on the uh, forestry sciences. And then we are also working closely with the University of Kyo, uh, which uh, the primary expertise in the, on energy and process engineering. So depending on this expertise, uh, each of us lead uh, important work packages. Uh, from Birmingham City University, we are uh, doing the preparations and also supporting on the uh, artificial intelligence enabled processing uh, from the Gorontalo. We are our uh, primary partner in doing the data collections on the field. And the University of Tokyo is the one uh, that um, leads on the uh, energy analysis of the plant species. So this is the uh, overview of the forest, like the picture that is uh, captured by our partner in Indonesia. So we can see a typical uh, rain uh, forest, uh, which has the biodiversity and a lot of uh, bioenergy potential that we can try to consider for uh, energy harvesting. So why Indonesia and Wallacea in particular? So obviously, like uh, as I mentioned before, Indonesia has a uh, bioenergy target up to 40% by 2030. Uh, at the moment, uh, it stands only 11.2%, so it's still uh, far away from the target. Uh, the immediate target will be around 23% by 2025, so Indonesia as a country is, is working towards their target. The reasons why we uh, look at the Wallace region, so Wallace region is located uh, around this area in Indonesia. So if you look at the Indonesia map, it's actually in the uh, middle part of Indonesia that consists of primarily uh, Sulawesi Island uh, with the neighboring islands such as uh, Nusa Tenggara uh, or Moluka, 
uh, Halmahera and, and so on and so forth. So this group islands is what we call as Wallacea. Uh, I think uh, if, uh, if some of you are working on the biology, Wallacea has been a top hop, one of the top hop spots in the world for the biodiversity. So it has the uh, richest uh, biodiversity characteristics uh, and huge forest area, low population. So we think that there could be uh, some bioenergy potential that we can we can learn more, we can investigate, and perhaps can help Indonesia in uh, achieving the bioenergy uh, target. Uh, so uh, our research will focus on this uh, province in Wallacea, the Gorontalo province, so which is located in the Sulawesi island. We hope that in the future, with hopefully more funding opportunity, we'll be able to expand this area. Uh, and then we are uh, gathering both the data uh, from the forest as well as the uh, socio-economic data in terms of how the neighboring communities interact with the forest. So this is the initial book survey that uh, our partner in Indonesia uh, has managed to gather around September and October. So they collected a couple of uh, three species that can help uh, in terms of uh, providing the uh, bioenergy. So that ranges from langsat, uh, coconut, uh, sugar palm, clove, durian, and so on and so forth. Uh, our partner in Tokyo is looking at uh, what uh, components from those trees can be uh, utilized, can be exploited to give us the uh, bioenergy sources. So they look at uh, shell, uh, fiber, uh, sap, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, our team at, uh, in the UK, Birmingham City University, we are working on the AI to estimate the bioenergy level of the forest plant species. Uh, the uh, primary method of achieving that is through remote sensing. Uh, the reasons behind that is because the forestry area in Wallace is huge, uh, but at the same time, remote, uh, sometimes it's quite dangerous to do the uh, manual uh, field assessment of the forest. So this is our uh, primary uh, or preliminary findings from uh, what we analyze on the uh, species from the drone. So we try to do these automatic classifications of different species. And once we are able to extract what kind of species we are able to detect from the drone, then we will be able to estimate the level of biomass that is available. So obviously, um, we, we try to integrate uh, the detections with the capability to estimate the biomass based upon the energy analysis that is uh, performed by our partner in Tokyo. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, our uh, partners in Tokyo, uh, Professor Aziz and Jinyue, to provide uh, some commentary on our work. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Prof, uh, Prof Taufik. Actually, uh, it's Aziz from the University of Tokyo, and it is really my, uh, my great pleasure and also honor to join the teams and also to join uh, or to participate in today's event, even actually. And uh, based on what uh, Professor Taufik has mentioned previously, that uh, actually it is also a really great experience for me for working together with uh, people coming from different uh, disciplines not only the countries, but also disciplines. Uh, no, actually, I am focusing on the energy systems, energy conversions, and what we need, actually, I mean, we would like to, to build to build any kind of scenario for the energy system is that we need the data. And uh, in this in this team, actually, what we are targeting for is that we are also would like to, we would like to have any kind of trusted data. And based uh, on this kind of data, we can build any kind of more accurate uh, scenario for energy productions or energy conversions, which is really, really required for local people, I think. And, and for the uh, conversion technology, actually, in this, uh, in this work, we are focusing on any kind of not very advanced technology, but uh, we are. We would like to focus on any kind of accessible uh, conversion technology because of okay, limited technological mastery and also investment. So in this case, we would like to uh, develop any kind of scenario which can extend or strengthen any kind of sustainability and also circular economy uh, for the local people. Thank you very much, Professor Taufik and Jinyue. Can you have also another comments? Um. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, my name is Jin Yuesui. I'm the PhD student at the University of Tokyo. It's my pleasure to comment. So about this project, this project will play an important role in the Indonesia bioenergy development because in the 21st century, it has become challenging to provide clean, affordable, and reliable bioenergy source. The, fo uh, the forest bioenergy can be beneficial if the potential bioresource can be found and the proper scenario can be applied. The scenario for each potential bio resources through the different conversion rules can reduce the energy demand peak in the future, even create considerable profit. As Professor Aziz commented, potential bio resources can be con converted into the electricity, solid, liquid, or gas fields via the thermal chemical or biochemical pathways. The property of the biomass is a crucial parameter to determine the a, a suitable conversion technology. Uh, furthermore, the final products can be utilized directly on site, or it is stored, or even be transported or distributed. As for me, I had an experience with bioresources utilization research. Um, my previous uh, project is about a technology platform for energy and recovery from a kind of biomass based poultry litter. The poultry litter causes many environmental problems that can also be used to produce energy. We consider the multiple technologies for treating the poultry litter in each processing stage. Each technology has pros and cons, which is similar to this project. So the proper bioresource utilization in this project can significantly fulfill the energy demand and reduce the impact on the environment. The benefits of the bioeconomy towards the environment can be sustainable for a long time if we discover and acquire those benefits very wisely. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor and Jinyue, for your uh, comments. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, our Indonesian partner comment. So Dr. Zulham and Dr. Waude, do you would like to say a few words about uh, the field work that has been undertaken, the experience that we can learn from the field? So uh, uh, please share your comments. OK, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank everyone for this opportunity. As we learned from the slides, especially regarding the demographic part as presented by Dr. Taufik, one of the major stakeholders in the forest area is the farmer communities who rely on uh, forest resources as their major income. Uh, we hope by understanding the potential of bioenergy plants around them, this will, lead, uh, uh, this will improve their insights uh, on the importance of sustainable agriculture management and eventually will lead them to a better management of uh, natural resources in the area. Uh, it shows the importance of stakeholder engagement as we fully understand that uh, local people's support for forest management is a vital element of conservation. Uh, later in this research, we are going to facilitate uh, focus group discussions involving related stakeholders, especially uh, local communities or the farmers to identify potential challenges and uh, to formulate directions to scale up the bioenergy production. We believe that the outcome we gain from this research will provide uh, vital information for the government and other stakeholders, of course, toward designing strategies and policies related to bioenergy, uh, which emphasizing the participation of communities. We also hope that uh, the outcome can encourage stakeholders to make use of forest bioenergy plants, both economically and ecologically sound. And um, anyway, it is very interesting for me to note that uh, collaboration in this research is not only between institutions, but also in uh, different fields of study. So we really appreciate that this kind of approach is accommodated by the British Council in Japan. Uh, I think it is very essential in community development because as we all know that so many problems related to climate change in our society that cannot be solved by relying on one field of study alone. So I believe uh, collaboration is very important, not only for us, but also for the wider community. Uh, lastly, we would like to say thank you for this opportunity and we look forward to work with everyone. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zulham. Uh, Dr. Waudi, do you, do you want to add a few words from your side? Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I'm Eti from Gorontalo State University, Indonesia. 
And I think the data shows here that the highest education level at the Dulomayo site is dominantly of elementary school graduates, which is 53.3%, uh, uh, is very low. And this provides uh, challenges and also opportunity to bring uh, awareness about the potential of bioenergy and plant, uh, plant spaces to enhance uh, education access for people, especially young children in this local community. And uh, mostly my work has closely related to young uh, children. Therefore, I want to provide uh, early awareness to this young generation related to the climate change and how it can save their future, especially here in Sulawesi. And it is hoped that this project can bring a real change to the way they see uh, woods, waste, and uh, agricultural plant materials as the major uh, renewable energy source in the future. And uh, I would like to thank the British Council and my team to allow me having this experience to be involved in this uh, prestigious research collaboration, which has boosted my confidence as an early researcher and getting to know many well-known uh, researchers from different universities and also different uh, countries. is really a, a wonderful experience. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Wilde. I really, really appreciate it. So I think I, I just going to pick up a few uh, key, key keywords uh, based on the comments. So one is uh, sustainability uh, from uh, Prof. Aziz. So what we are trying to do is not just uh, like one of uh, kind of approach, but how we can engage the community because we believe that there's a way we can achieve the sustainable interactions between human and, and forestry. Um, uh, we, we like also to, to highlight the importance of collaborations among different disciplines. Uh, this is actually my, uh, my and my team's first opportunity to work on, on, on energy analysis using AI technology. So we have been working on AI for, for, uh, for more than 10 years now. So this is actually a, a good opportunity how AI can help uh, improve the uh, energy analysis, how AI can uh, provide like a value in terms of uh, sustainability goals in the future. So uh, to conclude uh, our presentations from the consortium, we would like to thank uh, British Council to enable this uh, consortium to happen. And we hope that this will not be the end. Uh, in, instead, this will be the starting point of a fr fruitful collaboration and sustainable uh, research uh, opportunity uh, in the future. So as a conclusion, so I would like to uh, play a video on our research activity. Uh, we hope that we'll be able to meet soon in person uh, in Indonesia to do the field work and then to meet later in the UK to do some uh, dissemination activities. Uh, so this is the video. Bioenergy from wood, waste, the residual of agricultural and plain materials is the major renewable energy source in the future. Indonesian national energy policy has identified bioenergy as a significant contributor to the energy mix as we progress toward the low carbon in the future. Our research is looking at the bioenergy plants hidden in the forest through forest inventories. We undertake bioenergy research that incorporates disciplines such as forestry, agronomy, agro-system, biology, engineering, forestry, and economics. This collaboration is to advance research into sustainable biomass production, collection, and conversion. We are grateful for the opportunity to take part in this study. This brings Indonesia and the rest of the world a lot of optimism in terms of biofuel development. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, I just want to emphasize that we, we are open for collaboration. So if, if anyone from the audience would like to collaborate uh, with, with us uh, in the consortium, we, we will be very happy to explore that opportunity. So thank you very much. And I will pass it to, uh, to Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Tafik. It's really exciting having read about these projects on, on paper for, for many months to, to see what they actually look like and to see the energy ana analysis that's going on and to hear firsthand about the, the different value of these collaborations and uh, particularly the value of the interdisciplinarity. So thanks for sharing. Um, some of these themes we've picked up again in, in the panel discussion and we'll be, back, we'll, be, we'll be back to you for that, Tafik, in a minute. Uh, we're on to the fourth and final project. 
and I'm going to hand over to Craig Hutton at the University of Southampton, who will introduce the work that has been done around integrated strategies for water resources risk management, um, involving two other universities, Cantho University and Chilalongkorn University. Craig, are you, are you good to go? I can see your presentation, but I can't see you. Or Sorry, there we are. Doing the usual mute. Uh, are you able to see everything now, Matthew? And yep. hear me? Can see you, hear you. Got a, a dashing right. new beard, and we can also see your presentation. It's not that new, but yeah. Um, okay, so you've heard uh, a number of talks. Um, which have centered somewhat around the important issues of mitigation about carbon. And uh, Dr. Short gave some very useful outlines of you know, the trajectories we might be going on. And we've had uh, a couple of talks in addition to that, you know, around energy, around uh, how industry might respond and how we might think about biofuels. Now, um, the project that uh, you know we're very grateful to have been funded to undertake in, in our case um, is between four countries uh, with in Thailand, Vietnam, Japan, and the UK. Um, and it really focuses on understanding the potential risks of climate change and uh, abstracting the kind of information and data that decision makers may need to respond to that risk in order to be able to adapt. So I particularly work in the field of trying to map the distribution of risk. This project was a scoping project. So we were really looking for what data sets exist in two of our study areas, the Chapara data, um, Basin in uh, Thailand and the Mekong Delta Vietnam, which I've worked a lot on in the past uh, with colleagues. And we are aiming at initially understanding what data sets exist so that we could put together from this project in future to uh, actually go into detailed high resolution risk mapping aimed specifically at policymakers in Thailand um, and Vietnam and possibly other, other countries as well. So these are the basins and the area, the Mekong Delta and the Chapara River Basin. Um, this uh, is so on the, the sort of southwest tip of Vietnam. It's the Mekong River that's coming in. This is Cambodia up here. And in the Chapara Basin, um, you've got Bangkok down here, and it's a larger scale uh, basin. But they're two examples um, that we felt we could work on. Of course, they are any case studies and we, we would aim to do this. And we have done this in other countries as well. We want to bring this specific study uh, to these regions. So the objectives were to look at the policy landscape. There's no point coming in and thinking about risk and what is going on and what are the key issues at risk uh, if you don't understand what the country's policy structures are. So we've done a a review of the policy structure, not in great depth, but just identifying their key areas, along with a review of the literature. So we're using the literature as a data source here to understand what some of the key issues might be. We've been a, a systematic review of the literature was undertaken. We also um, undertook an audit and a review of what computational models were being used and what data sets were being used in these countries. So you have a policy review, a literature review, a data and models uh, review. And that audit provides us with an opportunity to look at gaps. We know what data we will need to produce risk and we can think about the gaps and we can see where the focus is. Where are the policy focuses? Where is the research focus? How can we, if we do a larger project, how could we marry those together? Um, we produced a conceptual model of risk, um, an outline, uh, something I've been working on for some time, uh, which is very much based on the IPCC approach to uh, risk. And one of the outputs of our work will be a short 
a summative overview research strategy bid. We hope that after COP26, where risk is a feature, and I work with a number of partners in risk in the COP activities, uh, we're hoping that there will be an interest in understanding in detail uh, the risk landscape. We ought to very quickly um, outline a strategy and what I mean by risk, what we mean you start when any of you are doing a project of this nature, we really need to understand that policy landscape, what is going on, there's no point turning up if it's not uh, already in the interests of the policy makers, the decision makers, we may discuss things that could be included in their activities in the major project, but we think about risk from the IPCC really is three components. There's the hazards, which are often water resource uh, related, the hazards coming from the climate, and we need to think about their duration, their magnitude, and the probability of these hazards occurring, floods, drought, salinity, heat waves, uh, and these will vary geographically, of course, and that's where we map exposure. We want to look at the populations and the assets and uh, see where the spatial distribution of that intersects with the spatial distribution of the hazards. So it's mapping the distribution of the hazards between now, uh, now and going forward in time. But critically, and uh, it's something that is sometimes left out of our risk mapping, is a fuller understanding of the vulnerability of the populations. So whilst you have a map of where your hazards and the nature of the hazards occurring, we also need to understand the dynamic nature um, at high resolution of the vulnerability of the population. Where are the poorer sectors, particular livelihoods that may be more susceptible? Um, and it's only when we combine those that we get to a climate risk. Socioeconomic vulnerability can be thought of as being composed of two things, which in their right will have elements, but adaptive capacity, the capacity of populations of whatever scale you're working on to respond to climate change, and the immediate sensitivity of their lives and livelihoods. Uh, do, are they, do they have the kind of agricultural livelihood, let's say, that is particularly exposed to flood? Uh, and are they in the longer term able to respond? And when we gather this information, and it takes quite a bit of time to do so, we can build high, high resolution climate risk maps for today. But we also can think about future scenarios. We can build models that look at these future scenarios. And indeed, we've done that. And that information should feed back into the policy landscape and assist in decision making processes. Um, in order to simply scope the, the data, so what, what we've done is we have generated, and I'll show you some outputs from the, if you remember, the policy analysis, the literature analysis, and the model analysis. We also wanted to understand the priorities of decision makers in these two basins. And this is a, just a sample of some of the people. It was well, well attended. Um, and we got their opinions on um, what are the key priorities? What are their priorities as stakeholders? Were we missing any literature? Were we missing any particularly important policies or models? Um, we had those meetings literally last week. Um, well, uh, this week, actually, on Monday and, and on Friday. So we've sort of rushed hot off the press. Um, these are some of our outputs. Um, I won't go into great detail other than to say that um, if we see these four components here, we have policy, we have the stakeholders' opinions, we have models, and we have literature. And what we've done is for hazard, the hazard component, here are the hazards that we've identified and we've aligned those for each one of these things to be able to look across and see where there's strong literature um, or demand from policy and see what the relationship is. The green line represents the Mekong and this sort of yellow color uh, represents the Chapaya and we can see between them. And this is the same thing for vulnerability. Now, there's lots of analysis to be done in here, but just some examples. If we look at groundwater discharge in the Mekong, there's very little policy in the Mekong around groundwater. However, stakeholders identify it as significant, um, though they identify most things as having some significance. 
but it's one of the stronger ones. There are models for it, and the literature is very strong. So the research is telling us that there's a great deal of concern or issues around groundwater quality. Um, and so that might be something we would want to work with policymakers on, bringing that information in and including it. Same with temperature and precipitation here, where there's very little on cyclones and typhoons, yet we know that there is a policy concern, there's no models. So we, if you see where every each of these arrows in the color, this is where we probably need to focus our research uh, in the Chao Pyre, we need to focus on the fact that there are very few models on soil erosion, for example. So this would help us think where we focus our risk efforts and construction of uh, models in the biophysical context. And down here in policy and vulnerability, well, if we look at this, there are, whilst there are lots of models that consider the hazard environment, floods, droughts, etc., in both basins, there are virtually none. We don't model potential vulnerability. So here is a giant gap that we've demonstrated in this work, that we need to be working on models that we can project into the future around social economics. This doesn't surprise me. It's true in much of the world. It's harder to do. This relies on physics and this relies on a complex understanding of socioeconomics. Uh, so it doesn't surprise me, but it's a gap, something British Council, we hope, you know, would be interested in, along with others. But of course, the other things that we did notice is the weakest areas amongst uh, the stakeholders on both bases were gender, culture and lit literacy. Again, not a huge surprise, because often um, uh, in the world, basin management occurs and water management is, tends to be engineers. Um, and it's often the case that their exposure to some of the important characteristics of gender, culture, literacy and education uh, is in other departments. So we spend a lot of our time trying to bring in understanding around, the, you know, the potential benefits of including issues like gender in our understanding of hazard. Um, but, you know, it is the policymakers, ultimately, it's their choice. Uh, but it is that could be a gap we would see from the perspective of um, the policy development. And, and that's true, we'll do a lot more analysis, but it's a very useful output for us, considering where the gaps are for research and developing uh, those ideas. There are There is a lot of data available to us. We carry out land use analysis data, poverty set data from census, biophysical data sets, uh, this is again land use and we can use climate models. Uh, this is some road network analysis work we can do thinking about access. Uh, there's a plethora of data that one brings together to make these risk maps and you have to think about the weighting of them, um, how they're related together and get experts to do that. Um, so that's, we've got our baseline data and we shall now be working on um, some integrated modeling of those components, thinking how they relate together, and really thinking about how could we put together a research strategy with our partners and others, uh, a proposal on this to, uh, to be funded, uh, which is where we would like to um, go next. Um, I will stop sharing and then invite, we have an ECR from one from Vietnam and uh, one from Thailand, and they. I'm going to ask them to contribute. Diem, did you want to start and do perhaps five minutes? Um, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Hilton and uh, Associate Professor Tree, the co BI of the project and the leader of the university team for giving me the uh, opportunity to participate in this interesting project. Uh, Professor Hilton mentions my name is Sam Gil Yim, one of early career researchers of this project. I'm currently working as the lecturer at the College of Environment and Natural Resources at Gunter University. Uh, joining this project is not only enhanced my knowledge on the climate risk hazards vulnerability, but also improve my expertise in many aspects from doing the literature review analysis and the synthesis of the research outcome, as well as improving my critical thinking in the research. 
participating in uh, an international project, including the scientists from the United Kingdom, from Japan, from Thailand, enhance my understanding of the working culture of the network nations. It's improved the foreign language and technology skill, which have me more confident in the communication with the international partner. As a female researcher, I receive priority and encouragement from the BI, co-BI, and, and other project member is making me more motivation in the project work. However, the difficulty is a balance, much of time for taking care of family while ensuring the effectiveness of the scientific research. However, the difficulties have been made to improve the planning skill to ensure the quality of project work and responsibility with the family. I personally really like that the passion and enthusiasm for the research is the most important with help each woman to be more confident and gain more energy to fulfill the passions and have more contribution to the scientific research community. This project is one step for the early career researcher like me to learn the social skill and research experience from the local and international experts, which is the foundation for further research in the area of climate change risk. I hope myself, I hope in the coming time, the funding foundation will consider to give more priority to multinational projects for exchange the research knowledge and will also give more opportunity for our young female researcher to have the chance to learn to expand the connection and contribute um, and have the condition for developing our career in the future. Thank you very much for giving us the chance to join with a very interesting project. Thank you. For um, and Chit Simon uh, from Thailand, would you like to do the same, please? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Professor Kei Kiltan. Hello, everyone. I am the I am Chit Simon and I am the ECR of Thailand team from Chulalongkorn University. I am a master student in the Department of Water Resort Engineering. And this provides me a great opportunity to work with professors and researchers from UK, Japan, and Vietnam. It is my great pleasure to be a part of this project. So we have worked together as a team for more than half a year, and we have meeting every uh, other week. I feel like we have learned a lot from each other, like how to process the work or how to deal with the problem. Is it already nice and sweet here? I can say that we have a good time here. So let's talk about Thailand experience with this project. We have learned a lot about how we can make an analysis to water resources and management in my country. And the highlight area is Chao Phraya River Basin. The study area in Thailand is Chao Phraya Delta. It is really important area in Thailand economically and socially. Our research focused on doing a literature review on data model and policy related to climate risk. The key components are hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. At first, we start by seeking in the literature review that we can find in Thailand. We as a team did a lot of research in our open source website, and we also tried to find the key literature in domestic source website too. We made the list of the literature separated by hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. And in each topic, we separate in more detail, for example, in hazard, we separate to water quality, dot, fat, and so on. And we also do the same to the data and module part and in the policy part too. We have a lot of discussion on our finding result to fill the gap we found as much as possible. We are really thankful for this project COP26, which gives us an opportunity to work with several experts and share ideas on climate risk as well, identifying a setting gap to look for research opportunity for our future work. And last Monday, we organized the workshop with stakeholders from Thailand. We invite many government agencies related to this project and the researchers who have high experience to discuss on our finding results. During the workshop, we received several comments to help shape our research so we can fix on what we missed and narrow our gap more. 
please make us understand more on our work and have more confidence on our finding. I think this project is very valuable for our country and also to me. Now we think that we are in the right direction. It is a great opportunity for being here. I am looking forward to work with the team more on the projects. Thank you. I think, I mean, it yes. is just as a final comment, I would say that this project um, channeled all the funding that was from the British Council yeah. to early career researchers. That's here in, in um, Southampton, where Evelyn um, has worked, has led from an ECR point of view, and in Newcastle, uh, where we've had a, a couple of um, ECRs and, and in, in both the countries. And so there was very much a focus on early career researchers working um, in this environment. Um, and I think one of the things that Diem said there uh, is really important saying about, you know, opportunities for female early career researchers, but also opportunities such that they become senior researchers in the future. And that's what we must invest in, that um, women um, don't, are encouraged at this level uh, to be leaders in, in, in later years, um, because what we mustn't do is just maintain a base of female researchers who then aren't actually seen rising up, you know, 20 years time, we want to see Chitsuman, uh, or 10 years time, Chitsuman and Diem leading these sorts of projects. Well said, Craig, and thanks for another excellent presentation. Um, and in Chitsuman's slides at the end, I could see Professor Tachikawa at Kyoto, and uh, I neglected to mention Kyoto in, in my introduction, um, but thank you. Yes, Kyoto Professor has Tachikawa. these two ECRs, I should say, as well. So. Professor Tachikawa is on the panel, so we'll be hearing from him. Yeah, we should talk with them because they've done tremendous work, again, with the female ECR. Let me hand over to Tofik to introduce our panelists, and we're going to spend the, the remaining time reflecting a bit further on the main discoveries from these research collaborations, uh, the value that they're delivering, and the ways in which we can ensure that they're sustainable. So thank you, Tofik, over to you. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, Mark. Uh, so I'm very pleased today that we are, I'm going to be joined by distinguished uh, panel members. Uh, so we have here uh, four panel, panel members uh, representing uh, different countries within this uh, COP26 trilateral uh, research program initiated by uh, British Council Japan. So I would like to welcome them all. So first we have uh, Dr. Michael Short. Uh, so Michael is an Impact Acceleration Award Commercialization Fellow and lecturer in uh, Chemical and Process Engineering at the University of Surrey. So Michael, do you, do you like to, to join me in this uh, panel discussion? Yeah, <laughs> yeah so Michael uh, expertise is on the applying mathematical modeling and optimization techniques uh, to develop software for efficient support in a wide range of uh, fields, including energy planning, water, heat integrations, reactor design, real-time optimizations of industrial processes and pharmaceuticals. Uh, Michael received PSC and PhD from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. So great to see you, Michael, today. Yeah, thank you very thank much you. for the introduction. Uh, so the second panel member will be uh, uh, the one that uh, Matt mentioned earlier, uh, Professor Yasuto uh, Tachikawa. So, Professor, you would like to, to join me in the panel? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, so Professor uh, Tachikawa is a professor in the Department of Civil and Earth Resource Engineering at the Kyoto University. His expertise is on water resource engineering, uh, particularly looking at how to analyze the change of water-related risk and water resources under climate change scenario. So thank you, Professor, for joining me today. Okay, so the third panel member uh, is from Malaysia, uh, Dr. Uh, Flora Somidin. Dr. Somitin is a lecturer at the Faculty of Chemical Engineering Technology at the University of Malaysia, Perlis. Uh, her research interest is on uh, materials engineering, particularly on the electronic uh, packaging materials. 
looking at the uh, lead-free solder alloys for electronic applications. So, Dr. Sobidin, thank you for joining me today. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the fourth panel member is from Indonesia. He's actually uh, a member in my consortium, so Dr. Iswan Dungia. Uh, so Dr. Isvan Dunia is a forest scientist with a broad and interdisciplinary interest that range from uh, forest management prioritations for Wallacea region. Uh, Dr. Dungia has been working with uh, a lot of international partners, including uh, Center International for Forestry, Forestry Research, uh, Darwin Initiative in the UK, BirdLife International, uh, SIDA in Canada, and also the national governments of Indonesia as well. So thank you, Dr. Tugio, for joining me today. Thank you. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, so uh, obviously, like we, we have heard uh, excellent presentations across four projects this uh, morning in the UK and evening in, in Japan. Uh, we have learned a couple of interesting uh, collaborations opportunities that are provided by the uh, COP26 uh, Trilateral Research Initiative. So this panel, we try to gain more insights on your experience and how you see this opportunity enable the development in each of your institutions. As well as yes, how do you see this uh, partnership uh, going forward in the future? Okay. Uh, so uh, I'm going to uh, let's say uh, through a couple of questions. Just before that, I, I remember that we have one more member in the panel, which is a uh, provocator. So we have uh, Dr. Uh, Disney uh, Gamara Lage uh, from University of Tokyo. Uh, so uh, Dr. Gamara Lage is, has um, expertise in chemical engineering. Uh, she's currently a project researcher at uh, Tokyo. Uh, her research interest is in the biomass, bioenergy, circular economy, and wastewater treatment. So hopefully uh, Dr. Disney will be able to stimulate the discussion further uh, around the uh, panel discussion. So thank you, Dr. for joining me. Thank you very much. Okay, so let me uh, start maybe asking these questions to uh, the uh, panel members. Uh, so uh, first of all, maybe you could share with us, with, with the audience, because obviously uh, some of this uh, story around the formations of the consortium is interesting. Uh, for, let's say, an institutions uh, or uh, academics to initiate collaborations, especially collaborations across uh, different countries. Uh, so uh, if you could please share, like, what story behind the formations of the consortium and how the project came together as a consortium and how your work is forward, I think that will be really, really interesting insight. So perhaps, uh, Michael, do you, do you like to, to start first uh, with the, your consortium? Yeah, sure. Um... I think this is one of the one of the uh, let's say weaknesses of academia is that when you start when you're looking for project partners it's very much I know a guy and that guy knows a guy um, and I, I think that this is some, I mean obviously you can let's say cold call people in order to kind of get, get see if they're willing to to work with you um, in our specific case um, Dominic and I knew each other through my PhD supervisor back in Cape Town um, and Dominic was um a yeah regular collaborator with with us back in when i was in cape town and then since i uh, joined the since i uh, came to the uk um dominic and i have been working on a, a couple a couple projects um not related to this call and then when this call came up it was sort of an opportunity for us to potentially work together and we we never we we kind of had you know let, let's say one student here working on a small project but never never really let's say a focused larger larger scale project or with any funding and so um yeah and then dominic knew uh, uh professor yasunori kikuchi at the university of tokyo and um yeah we we let's say i think that at the most most of the time you, you pull together a team in order to um almost meet the criterion of a of a project but but then you end up kind of um, using that as the as something that, that starts something bigger, right? So you see, okay, so because we wanted to work together as the three of us, we said, okay, what are your expertise in? What are your expertise in? What do we what do we want to do as a as a group? What can we do? And um, that's why I love I love funding calls because often funding calls themselves are the um, the motivator for research. Like, um, and I think we've been doing some really, really interesting things that I probably didn't expect to be doing two years ago as a result of, of the call. And I think it's probably the same for you, Tofik, um, because you, you mentioned that you were working in machine learning. And again, I'm working in optimization, um, control, 
uh, more process design and now we're doing energy planning as a result of this um, this collaboration so um, yeah <laughs> I think that that's so it, good, it was sort of a good, we all, good, good we all knew that that. Was, yeah which has brought us together yeah sure that is really really uh, interesting actually I, I'm just writing down some of the key keywords from from that so uh, Prof uh, Tachikawa uh, would, you, would, would you like to, to share the insights of the formations of the consortium yeah thank you very much um the reason for this our joint research project is Renke. Uh, Renke is a Japan-UK university collaboration program by six universities in the UK and six universities in Japan, uh, which was established in 2012, about 10 years history. And the purpose of the Renke program is to promote student and research exchanges between UK and Japan. And I very much appreciate the British Council that plays a very important role as the secretariat of this ranking program. Uh, since uh, 2018, uh, we have held a workshop on climate change every year for the development of joint research a program between UK and Japan. And we organized a total of three workshops every year. So we know each other. And uh, we uh, met many uh, researchers in UK, especially University of Southampton and the University of Newcastle. And we have, University of Southampton has a long collaboration with Kanto University in Vietnam. And Kyoto University has a long well, uh, collaboration uh, with uh, in uh, University in Thailand. So we come together and we uh, successfully uh, make one team, uh, UK, Japan, Vietnam, Thailand joint research that began, began last year. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor. That's really uh, actually quite, quite interesting to learn about this initiative on the research exchange uh, between the UK and, and Japan. And I do believe in this uh, globalization world with uh, more and more uh, seamless interactions among different uh, research groups uh, in the world. I think uh, things are, are more and more possible. Um, and that's actually to, uh, great to learn. And it's not just, I think, I believe it's not just about the, the expertise, but also experiencing different culture. Yes, uh, yes. I think that's that's really, 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 really important uh, for us to be like a global citizen. Uh, yeah, thank thank you for the insights. Yes. Okay, so uh, Dr. Sobidin, could, could you please uh, uh, maybe uh, elaborate the kind of experience that uh, you uh, uh, you um, managed to to have within this uh, consortium, and how, how what is the story behind the uh, John Moore's, uh, Berlis, and and Gunma University consortium? Um, well, we we actually um, before this uh, COP twenty six um, project, we actually uh, knew each other through um, from other projects as well and through other researchers and we are all actually in the research uh, matter research communities uh, especially we uh, all have been doing um, lead free solder which is um, in uh, my uh, my group we are specialized in um, uh, the research on uh, lead free solder and we actually aware uh, each other each other groups and then we we uh, with LJMU Liverpool uh, John Small University we have uh, actually have a MOU already and they, they came to our university um, to uh, two three years ago in uh, 2018 and we uh, uh, some of our students in Unimap uh, PhD students uh, also went to um, to the uh, to LJ, LJMU and uh, did some um, collaborative uh, research works. Did some laboratory works. And while uh, for Gunma University, uh, we actually uh, uh, aware with the, uh, with this group through um, actually through from my uh, previous uh, professor uh, Kazuhiro Nogita, which is our uh, uh, he is uh, my uh, supervisor in um, uh, PhD uh, in University of Queensland. And we know that uh, they are also been doing this uh, lead-free soldier uh, research. Oh well, um, this COP26 um, is uh, um, 
I believe it's a very great platform, although we actually aware of each other, but we, we, we don't know how to uh, do some, uh, probably we have uh, collaborations, we want to do some collaborations, but we need a great uh, platform, I believe, to, to start um, doing this um, great research. And also we have a different expertise while uh, like in, um, in my group, we are focusing on the uh, solder developments. Uh, and while in Gunma, they have a very good uh, laboratory um, instruments for, especially for mechanical testing. And while in uh, LGMU, they, they uh, have um, non-destructive uh, uh, testing labs. So um, I think with this um, uh, collaborations, we hope that uh, we can um, we can develop uh, new lead-free solder materials, especially for uh, power um, power electronics. Uh, so uh, I hope that um, it, this um, lead-free solder uh, that we uh, the formulations that we hope new formulations, especially lead-free. Um, will be ready, readily uh, available um, for use for electric car in the near future through these uh, great collaborations. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Swamit. And obviously that actually re-emphasize actually the, the connections that uh, we usually build when we start our research career, the importance of PhD, maintaining the connections to the after the PhD is really important because that's actually our first uh, research experience. I just pick up a couple of things here. Research community this is also another important avenue to uh, potentially find uh, colla colla collaboration setting. In my field, we have uh, IEEE and ACM. So that is usually the, the community that we engage quite quite closely. And if we, we do need to, to find collaboration, it's usually like a conferences are usually a great platform to initiate collaborations. Uh, that actually answers some of the questions asked in the Q&A. So uh, like personal networks are cl clearly important funding calls to bring together collaborators, uh, but you know, what else can, can, can be done? So in, in this case, perhaps like research community, uh, uh, networks of networks will always be, be key because networks of our collaborator could potentially be our potential network as well. So really, really good insights. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Iswan, uh, would you like to yes. share the story behind of our consortium, obviously, you know, from your perspective? <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Taufik. Professor Taufik is uh, our partner, uh, including uh, Professor Ajis from Tokyo University. And I think according to uh, Professor Taufik's presentation before, everybody knows that uh, bioenergy is an important issue because there is growing interest internationally to use bioenergy for the transportation, fuel, heat, and electricity, given the potential for significant environmental benefit and to combat climate change as well. Uh, growing the concern over the security of energy supply triggered by uh, soaring global oil prices caused uh, pressure in many countries, including Indonesia, to find alternative energy that uh, in turn has led the growing interest in uh, bioenergy use as mean to diversify the national energy mix. In our perspective as a researcher, forest plant bioenergy can also strengthen the economic incentive for private sector and community group to undertake a restoration effort. One example for bioenergy research that can be developed comes from forest plant spaces. We believe bioenergy from forest plant spaces with waste, oil producing, uh, or wood that can be converted uh, to biomass energy has uh, the potential to produce clean energy, secure rural livelihood, and restore degraded uh, lands. But uh, if not carefully, we mean it, it, it could displace food for uh, or, or, or promote land clearing. Uh, uh, Based, based, based on uh, a brief explanation, I think uh, research on bioenergy need a new approach through multidisciplinary science. Multidisciplinary science bioenergy teams are, cap are, are, are capable of achieving a new scientific insight that were just far not possible. In terms of how we come collaborate to carry out this research, at the very beginning of the formulation ideas, 
for this research, Professor Taufik from BCU and Professor Aziz from Tokyo Uni, who firstly introduced me to bioenergy is to open up to the opportunity to work and gain invaluable experience during bioenergy discuss, offer uh, an initial idea to continue create a new research proposal on fire uh, on forest uh, plant uh, species bioenergy. Actually, I met uh, with Professor Tarfik when I was uh, internship in Oxford University and Cambridge 10 years ago uh, in 2020. Professor Tarfik introduced uh, Professor Ajis to me as an uh, expert in uh, bioenergy engineering. And we then started actively uh, discussing to build commitment to do research on bioenergy. And I uh, feel honored to be a part of managing team on this research and very grateful to British Council Health Funder our research. Thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ivan. So obviously, again, uh, emphasizing the, uh, the importance of connections uh, during PhD, actually, uh, just to, to add uh, uh, just a couple of uh, lines around, around that. Actually, I met uh, Dr. Rizwan like uh, 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, I forgot exactly, but uh, we, we did meet during uh, our PhD years. And actually, at the time, we uh, didn't think about uh, potential collaborations because we are not working totally in a different fields. I work on computing and information engineering, where, whereas Dr. Rizal is working on forestry. But when uh, this opportunity came out, I think we, 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 we see the common point and we see how the uh, computing uh, information engineering can, can bring new insights to the uh, forest project. So that's actually a good opportunity for us as well. So thank you. Uh, so I would love to offer uh, Dr. Kishni to see if there is any anything that you want to pick up from, from how the consortium is formed. Uh, what's your perspective as, as uh, let's say, early care researchers? Yeah, I want to uh, raise uh, a question on the, on the panel about the uh, strategy on selecting the most suitable partners uh, for the trilateral projects. Uh, I understand that uh, most of the collaborations are happening with the people uh, that already have created a network, people who already know in the field. So I wonder, um, would it be better uh, for the outcomes of the project uh, or the, um, mm, will that be, uh, if the selection criteria was different, will that be different, uh, differently affect the project? And uh, I wonder, wouldn't it be more beneficial for a project and the institute uh, to work with a new set of experts and, and create a new collaboration network. So, uh, sure. uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Dishi. So I, I would like to uh, maybe uh, add uh, a couple of lines uh, behind that question. So I think the, the selection of the team, but I just want to add uh, the insights maybe on the sustainability of the partnership because that's actually linked together, right? So perhaps I uh, would like to invite uh, uh, insights from uh, at, at least uh, two, two panel members here. So maybe, uh, uh, Michael, do you want to provide insights on how to select a partner and how you see the partnership uh, being sustainable uh, through the partnership? Yeah, no, it's a it's a really it's a really good point. And I think that I see a question from Susanna Morley, which is kind of related along this, like how does an early, early career researcher put together a partnership like this? Um, and I mean, I think I'm a good example because I only started my uh, my PI role. So being a lecturer in a department as a permanent staff member um, in 2019. So it was pretty much like I got this was my first ever um, funding that I, that I received. Um, as a PI. And so um, it, is, it is very difficult when you're a young researcher to kind of get in on the conversation with senior, senior researchers. Um, and that is why I think that as, as researchers, we need to create environments, for example, when we're running our team meetings that are as inclusive as possible to allow and friendly. You want young researchers to feel comfortable to voice an opinion, to ask a question, and to um, you know, and to come across as not being some aloft, I'm an academic in my ivory tower, you can't approach me. Um, you need uh, the academics, even though we are pressed for time, I do appreciate that we need to spend um, time kind of asking about family life, asking about um, personal stuff so that you can all realize that we're all um, 
we can be kind of partners and um, the, the better you know the people around you and the more you can um, adapt your work schedule around the personal lives of people, um, I think that opens doors for people that wouldn't, ne wouldn't normally necessarily be involved in, in research. And obviously we need as many opinions and, um, and bits of expertise. And uh, the, the question about selecting partners, it is often about who you'd like to work with. Um, and so the friendlier, the more open we are, the more we're likely to want to work with individuals. Um, and, I, and I think that like within my research group, I really try to keep it as light and um, not too serious. We need to, obviously we're dealing with very serious topics, um, but we're all people and we're all, we can all be kind of work together. The more friendly we are and uh, the more we can kind of um, relate to each other. Um, I, I think that that's kind of very important and that will encourage more young career researchers to, to get involved. The other comment about, um, about conferences and, and those sorts of things. So this is why it's important because at conferences, a lot of the big professors sometimes are unapproachable and we need to kind of have this all the way down, this kind of more being more approachable as, as humans. The other thing is funding as well. We need to have funding and be less, maybe, I don't want to say less selective about letting people into conferences, but obviously for young, early career researchers, it, some conferences can be extremely difficult to get into. And thus excludes researchers that maybe have, let's say their PhD topic. I mean, I'm so far away from my PhD topic now, right? And so the, um, the, the thing is we need, we need people to kind of, see that re that the things that they're working on can be can be applicable in multiple fields and um, the only way that they can do that is by letting people into our conferences and it's sometimes difficult when you've got such selective conferences for young researchers who may who may not have the um, the supervision or the the uh, um, the passion for the exact thing that they're doing their phd in to 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 access these these uh, these conferences and these networks so and and obviously the funding from from uh, poor, poorer countries. I mean, I'm from South Africa. It was extremely difficult for me to to go to the U.S. for a conference, for example. The amount of money that it costs and um, the, the availability of funding in South Africa was, was a challenge. And uh, these are these are all the the boundaries that make it difficult for early career researchers to find these networks and and start these relationships. Thank you, Michael. Uh, really, really useful to learn that. And I think that's will. We'll, I'm sure that it's going to be very, very useful as a reference for early career researchers to start their career and how they climb up the ladder and also the, the opportunity provided by, you know, funding and, you know, all these uh, uh, possible uh, avenues for, for support. So, Prof. Pachikawa, perhaps uh, would like to maybe, uh, as a senior academic, obviously, uh, with uh, years of experience in the field, maybe if you could uh, shed some light around the uh, sustainability of partnership, uh, how we, 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 we uh, make sure that the partnership that we build will be sustainable, not just one of but sustainable for, for, the, for the foreseeable future. So perhaps you could uh, provide some insights with your experience. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think that it is very important is to proceed with the current research. Now we have a very nice opportunity and to proceed with current research is very important. And now we are um, under the leadership of Professor Hutton. Uh, we discuss the research progress and next directions every two weeks. Every two weeks we have a seminars and discussions about one seminar, about two hours. And very nicely, many early career researchers and PhD students from UK, Japan, Vietnam, and Thailand are uh, participated in this project. So they are, I think, very important because the next 10 years, next 20 years, they are readers and they know each other now. So I think that this uh, communication and friendship is very, very important. So I really, I think, like, I, I think that now we have a very strong team was formed. And I think uh, this research outcomes now very, I think about one year and the budget is very much limited, but without doubt, this research outcomes will develop into the next much more larger and long research project. So I think that now this current research project we're going is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's really, really uh, useful to learn actually is about the research directions and research progress, being able to discuss that with the, the partners and identify how we see the 
uh, direction in our research domain for the foreseeable future. I think you, you did mention something around 10, 20 years, what's, what's going to happen and involving early career researchers such as PhD students, research fellows to get involved in that. I think that's really, really useful because they will be they will be they will be us as an academic perhaps uh, in those years right so i think that's really really uh, well noted points i think thank you i'm just aware about the time i really lo love to have this a bit longer I'm just aware about the time but maybe uh last questions to dr somitin and dr iswan uh so i'm sure that you have been involved in this project for uh, months already so what 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 help uh what the value uh, do you manage to get from this project and how do you plan to take this project forward? So if you could provide some insight on your experience with the current project, I think that will be really useful. So uh, maybe Dr. Somirin, do you, would you like to start first? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, Prof. Um, well, um, actually, I'm looking forward to uh, this, you know, this year, 2026 is very, um, just a one year project but um i'm also a uh, early care uh, care um let's uh, i just work i just finished my phd uh two uh, i think one year ago so it's really hard for me to to do um this um collaborate collaborations with um as, as dr michael say it's really hard to approach the the uh, professor from other um university so um um, through this, um, like today, uh, I, I knew, I, I know uh, everyone, and I am aware of um, other research uh, as well. So um, the the um, the projects that we've been doing is uh, still progressing, but because of our uh, the expertise from uh, different um, groups, uh, the uh, the research is uh, going smoothly. It's progressing uh, very. Uh, Fast, better than uh, we are just doing it uh, alone, actually. So um, for uh, next, we, we really, uh, I really for, for myself, I really want to uh, visit um, um, this um, other university and see how uh, how can we uh, do some um, research, other research, and hopefully with this um, uh, with this project. Uh, it will be still um, uh, going, and uh, even though it's um, uh, finished uh, in within one year, but uh, I hope that um, we can go for uh, more like publications. We should continue um, to do this uh, kind of research, especially for young researcher like me. Um, for now, uh, I'm aware that um, we need to do more research on uh, climate change. So, so I think it's a uh, Really a great pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Samidin. Uh, Dr. Isiswan, do you do you want to say a few few words about your what 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 uh, uh, do you get from this uh, partnership so far, and how, how do you intend to take this forward? Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Taufik. Um, I believe uh, when I work with international researchers, can uh, provide new insight, get new source of funding, and even career boost. You know, a uh, project in bioenergy field sometimes require expensive infrastructure uh, that no single country can afford its own. Not everybody can have their own. So we need to collaborate to afford the science. When we multilateral research, we can idea structure border and one can, uh, no one control to our ideas. One of the great strengths for, of uh, multilateral research is uh, the innovating that comes from bringing together research of different background, experience, and perspective. Uh, well, discoveries achieved by diverse uh, minds and across application of tools in analytical approach have a tremendous potential to fill existing knowledge gaps, clear uh, roadblocks, and facilitate translation to of basic science discovery uh, as a as, as solution towards addressing uh, some of the most uh, pressing uh, global issues. Thank you, Dr. Tafi. Thank you. So I just want to pick up a couple of uh, very, very interesting points there is about the uh, enabling tools for uh, collaborations, uh, also the uh, publications, uh, 
identification of funding opportunities because obviously we came from different countries. I think different countries will have a different funding opportunities by themselves. So I think this opportunity will open up those doors. Uh, and also I just want to mention it's about the power of team spirit. Uh, we can do much more as a team rather than individual collections of individuals. So great, thank you very much for joining me. Very interesting insights uh, and uh, hope that we can expand this collaboration, not just within our consortium, but across the consortium. So I'm sure that we can, we can do. Uh, and thank you for British Council for enabling this uh, opportunity. And with that, uh, thank you very much. And I will return this to Matt. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Tafik, and thanks to all our panelists. Uh, you've given us a lot to think about. We we look forward to COP26 and um, hope it will be a terrifically successful summit. Um, on behalf of the British Council, let me say how how delighted we are with the progress of these four projects. And it's been exciting to hear um, how far you've got in, in really not a huge amount of time. And considering all of the additional restrictions um, that we're, we're navigating during the pandemic, um, we, we look forward to, to hearing um, how, how the projects conclude as, as they reach the, the one year mark. Um, it sounds like there's real ambition to, to find the next tranche of funding so that these collaborations can grow. And um, so many, so many valuable foundations have, have been put down, really, um, that, that they are full of potential to, to do so much more. So we, we, we will be looking to support you in, in any way that we can. We're slightly over time. Um, it's been an incredibly rich session. Uh, behind the scenes, we've had support from uh, a tech partner called Medica, and I want to say thank you to them um, and uh, two uh, British Council colleagues um, have been working fiendishly hard to ensure this came together. Um, so let me let me close by also thanking Tomoko and Mariko for for everything they've done to make this session possible. Thank you for your time. Uh, so many exciting conversations. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.